be honest, mm. I rather recognize myself as a Hong Konger. It's hard for me to be proud as a Chinese student. For me, I'm also very proud that I'm from Hong Kong, but also I'm equally proud to be Chinese. Hey guys, it's Key Bros. So today we are reacting to our Channel News Asia interview with another Hong Kong youth. Before we start, I'd like to tell you guys that I was unfortunately cut from the video because according to CNA, it would be fairer to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion. I want to clarify that there's always room for improvement because this is actually our first ever live interview slash debate on such a huge channel in Singapore's national media after all. As always, we really, really appreciate any form of comments on how we can improve and could have done better. We just hope that we have succeeded in presenting an alternative perspective to CNA's Singaporean audience and also global audience, as well as any local viewers from Hong Kong or from mainland China. Also, we must really acknowledge and recognize our fellow guest KK's willingness to engage in a civil and open debate and dialogue with us, which is something really rare in Hong Kong society in the past um, two years. And hopefully this has triggered a positive response within Hong Kong's younger generation. All of us actually have a common purpose, regardless of our political views, which is to secure a better, more stable and prosperous future for our city. Building bridges and healing divisions is the first step towards this goal. And we, Key Bros, are fully committed to this objective. With that in mind, we are here today to present some food for thought, counter arguments, and also some ideas on some of the points which were raised in the video. Now, before we start, we must state that any critiques in this video are not personal nor directed against any individual. We are simply here to address the ideas and examples concerned. Now, first of all, we must address the label that was given to us by CNA. We believe that we are no less pro-democracy and pro-Hong Kong compared to our guest, and it is rather misleading to say that we are pro-Beijing. Obviously, we are very proud to be Chinese, but I think we all understand the connotations of that label. So we expressly regret that this label was used, and we must stress that those who value the rule of law in civil dialogue are in fact more pro-democracy than those who do not. Also, we wanted to note that in the description of the video, CNA labeled us originally from Guangdong. Now, I have to say, both me and my friends we were both born in Hong Kong and raised in Hong Kong. If you want to say that we are originally from Guangdong, it also applies to our learned friends, KK as well. Apart from the 5,000 indigenous people who had been in Hong Kong when the British colonized us in the Opium War, are quote unquote originally from the mainland. So we're either both originally from the mainland or not. Otherwise, it's pure double standards and it's only speculative to say that we're from Guangdong and he is not. And to be honest, mm. I rather recognize myself as a Hong Konger. So maybe sometimes um, it will make us Hong Kongers to be ashamed to recognize ourselves as Chinese. So one of the points that our friend makes is that there is a conflict between being a Hong Konger and being Chinese. The question that often springs to mind is this, what does it actually mean to be a Hong Konger? So we will look at this matter from two perspectives. The first one is language, and then the second one is values. So a lot of people often associate Mandarin with being Chinese and Cantonese with being a Hong Konger. Well, apart from the fact that 35 million people in the mainland also speak Cantonese, we must recognize that language is simply a tool to communicate and break barriers. Of course, dialects should be preserved and we should carry on speaking Canto and should be our first language. But I think if we apply the same logic, we should be equally concerned about the dialects of our grandparents. In fact, if our grandparents held the same mentality towards Cantonese as some Hong Kongers hold towards Mandarin and mainland culture, then literally a third of Hong Kong would still be speaking the Chiu dialect instead of speaking Cantonese. Linguistic homogeneity is a prerequisite for economic prosperity, and it's also really essential for unity. Again, that is not to say that we should not preserve our uniqueness. We want to stick to the Hong Kong identity. We should actually speak both. Well, I think that um, like Hong Kong is my birthplace, mm -hmm. and I really like it, mm -hmm. and I want to try my best like to protect my own culture. Now, moving on to values, we also want to say that many young Hong Kong people actually are clueless about Western values and culture. 
they actually do not understand or adhere to such values, especially when they use violence to silence dissenting opinions and views. Because in a truly full-fledged democracy in the West, dissenting voices are tolerated. And also you won't exclude people from the Hong Kong identity if they disagree with you politically. For example, by labeling them as sellouts, Wu Mao's, you know, telling them to go back to China. This sort of ostracization and removal from the collective identity is actually, I have to say, no different from the Cultural Revolution in mainland China during the 1960s to 70s, where there was a totally unified ideological mentality that was demanded. So in this sense, there was no room for individuality under the so-called definition of Hong Kong values. Chinese youths and Hong Kong youths will never find common ground. I think um, under such different culture and different governing system, it's really hard to find a common ground. We are also trying to protect the culture of our birthplace by being the best of both worlds. To this point, we also have to wonder why we have such different views of the world, despite being born and raised under the same governing system and so-called culture in the same city. This is just a rhetorical question for you to think about. They did a lot of things that make shame of themselves in the okay. international stage. Any especially examples? Like, like. Especially like litter or spit on the floor. Mm -hmm. I know that it is improving, but I would say it's hard for me to be proud as a Chinese youth. Mainlanders actually also despise the poor behavior of a small minority of Chinese tourists or people. You know if you've frequently visited Weibo. I've been to Mainland China many times and everywhere in toilets, you know, I've seen posters all over the place in the mainland that promote civilized behavior, such as or in Mandarin, Undeniably, in the past, many Chinese tourists have had a negative image for their country. But I also have to say that in the past decade or two, say if you talk to a mainland Chinese youth, or observe their behavior, or interact with mainland Chinese tourists in Europe today, as we have done, you realize that these acts are practically non-existent anymore among them. This shows improvement and progress. On the other hand, I have to say, many Hong Kong people, because we live in Hong Kong, right? We're from Hong Kong, also actually spit and litter on the floor. Does that mean we should also be ashamed of Hong Kong people too as well? We were ashamed to observe the violent acts carried out over the past few years in our society. But at the same time, we recognize the need not to generalize the behavior of a very violent minority to represent the entire Hong Kong population. We in fact love the majority of Hong Kong people, regardless of their political views. And I think the same approach should be taken in relation to certain Chinese tourists and people from the mainland too, from the perspective of Hong Kong. I think Chinese youths or Chinese mm -hmm. in overall, they didn't look at a full picture of right. human rights. The Communist Party, yeah. CCP, is over everything. So what the CCP told them must be right and should be done. Now we turn to the diversity in human rights. Now, first of all, I want to question whether our learned friend actually understand what human rights are. What is his definition? He says that we should look at a full picture, which I fully agree. But in fact, we should actually look at both civil and political rights, which is one category of human rights, and also economic and social rights. These two actually form two different covenants in the world. One is called ICCPR, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And the other one is the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights. But in fact, what he refers to is only civil and political rights. In Hong Kong, thankfully, under one country, two systems, we actually have both. We have the ability to speak freely. Freedom of speech is guaranteed under the basic law. We can protest, it's guaranteed as well. But equally, we also have the rights and the privilege to walk safely in, on the streets at 3 a.m. Moreover, China has repeatedly stated that it does respect the principle of universality of human rights, which is the idea that human rights apply to every country. China does note, however, that the national realities of different countries have to be taken into account. And it is therefore important that countries engage in dialogue and cooperation based on equality and mutual respect. We think a quote is really applicable here, which is human rights are best understood 
in terms of the pragmatic imperative for desired results instead of objective truth, which is the idea that human rights are supposed to be used to make people's lives better and improve standard of living instead of blindly chasing certain ideals. It is really unfair to suggest that the Chinese people do not understand human rights simply because they interpret the concept differently from the West. And it is fundamentally Eurocentric to deny the validity of alternative views. It is also very interesting to note that the United States of America has actually not ratified the ICESCR. Now, this covenant was actually stressed by mostly former communist slash socialist countries. But in fact, many Western countries also signed up to it as well. Like all European Union member states, the UK, Australia, Canada have signed up to it, but only the USA. have not done so. So this shows again US exceptionalism. People often overlook the strides that China has made in terms of human rights. From the enactment of the 1950 Marriage Act, which outlawed arranged marriages and polygamy, to lifting 800 million citizens out of poverty in the past four decades. In recent years, with the implementation of the general principles of the civil law and tort liability law in 2020, personal legal rights and contractual protection have similarly been enhanced. There is also an influential Weibo account, Legal Report, which has garnered over 3 million followers. There, hosts conduct daily talks explaining legal provisions, rights, and notably cases. We must remember that China is a vast and diverse country where legal awareness is not prevalent among many of its grassroots citizens and local officials. But it is undeniable that efforts are being made to entrench, reinforce, and strengthen the rule of law within China. Under these circumstances, sometimes Chinese people will forgot the most important thing in human rights, such as the freedom to protest or the freedom of speech. So just to give you an example of the diversity in human rights, according to the ICCPR and the ICESCR, there are over 80 broadly defined human rights in total, many of which are indeed prerequisites to having free speech, such as the right to food, which is Article 11 in the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, Health Article 12 and Education Article 13. Is it really possible to have free speech or meaningful political rights or the right to vote if you don't have education? So an illustration of the full picture of human rights is seen in Tibet. Obviously, the West routinely overlooks the increase of primary school enrollment rates from 2% to 99.5%, illiteracy rates from 5% to 99.4%, since reunification in 1951. Of course, this is not to say that Chinese policy in Tibet is perfect, but we believe that we must look at the picture of human rights holistically, as our friend has suggested. Political rights cannot meaningfully exist without the provision of social economic rights. Like from my experience by talking to people from the mainland, they can actually criticize the government. Uh, I've seen protests of people in villages like in Guangdong or other parts of China against the government. So obviously no country has a perfect system, and obviously nor does China. But those who are open-minded enough to observe what is happening in China will find that on Weibo, there is a constant flow of criticism on government policies and social injustices. This has been launched against local officials, even provincial officials, but also university professors and people in other positions of power. Here, it is also crucial to consider that free speech can indeed be used to rectify injustices and unfairness without touching upon sensitive topics such as separatism and subversion. Of course, we recognize the censorship runs the risk of silencing voices that contribute to civil discourse and social progress. The existence of red lines does not imply that free speech cannot be put to effective use. But we also understand the need to protect national security and social stability. We trust that there is a balance to be found. So going forward in the mainland and in Hong Kong, we believe that constructive and good faith criticism should continue to be voiced out on social media platforms. I did mention government censorship in the West as well. It's just that it was unfortunately cut out by CNA. I talked about examples of Julian Assange, 
and also Edward Snowden have actually been routinely not only silenced, but in fact imprisoned, as in the case of Assange, um, for voicing out their opinion and also raising concerns for some of the government practices. All I want to say is that censorship appears both in the West and in the East. We should look at it holistically and not apply hypocrisy and double standards. Have so big of a conflict. So I think I'm, I will not agree with them and my mind will not change. It's really hard to find a common ground. I find it rather ironic that some Hong Kong protesters suggest that they can move to the UK and assimilate into local culture and integrate into the UK society really easily. But then somehow they're fundamentally different from people who are of the same ethnicity and speak the same language. In our experiences studying in the UK, Ashley, most if not all of the mainland students that we have met were open-minded and willing to discuss different points of view. In fact, they have very different political views amongst themselves too. Some voice their support for so-called pro-democracy protest, no matter in Hong Kong or in Thailand or in other places, while some believed that the protesters were actually misguided. But the important thing is we were never ostracized or singled out for being from Hong Kong, even at the height of the violent protest in 2019. So it is definitely not true that we cannot talk peacefully unless we go in with this sort of antagonistic mentality. And I think this mentality really stems from this superiority complex that some people in Hong Kong have towards the mainland. And we really need to move on from the stereotypical views that people have of the mainland from 30 years ago. We need to be open-minded, be willing to communicate, but most importantly, we need to go and see for ourselves how far the mainland has come. There is no denying that certain differences in culture and governing systems exist, no matter between Hong Kong and mainland China, and also the world, in fact. However, historically and legally speaking, it is true also that we are, we were, and we will be an inalienable part of China according to the basic law, but also according to historical facts. The combination of these two factors resulted in the implementation of one country, two systems. It is neither realistic nor correct to alter the status quo. Peaceful coexistence and aiding each other under the umbrella of the Chinese nation is the way forward. There is no reason why we cannot play different roles while working towards the common goal in a unified and united fashion. The presentation of independence and also becoming another mainland Chinese city as an exclusive binary choice is inaccurate. Just to clarify, both of us, we support the status quo, keeping our unique values while at the same time embracing and integrating with the mainlands to have the best of both worlds. So that marks the end of our video today. Thank you so much for watching Heroes. And please stay tuned by pressing the red button below and subscribe to Key Bros. And also give this video a thumbs up if you liked the video. Right, so see you guys in the next episode. And we hope you stay tuned as we have more exciting episodes to come and interviews as well as vlogs. All right, bye.